VeloFix is the source for all of your bicycle needs. When it comes to parts as well as repair, VeloFix is there to help you get back on the road. It's a mobile bike shop on wheels. Check them out at VeloFix.com. And here in Southern California, Paul Dunlap is there at every gravel event, fondo, and bike race to take care of your bicycle and have you get back out there. Check them out at VeloFix.com. The simple act of riding a bicycle today can put people at risk. If you've been to Southern California, you've seen your share of tourists flooding the beach areas and distracted drivers. When the unavoidable accident happens and you're involved, make sure to protect yourself with an attorney who knows the law and knows bikes. Attorney Josh Benici of Benici Law Group of San Diego has been riding in SoCal for over 25 years. Josh offers free consultations to cyclists, and if you have a bike injury, make sure to call Benici Law Group. For more information, go to BeniciLawGroup.com. I have no qualms about riding for like my teammates who are, you know, when they, when they, you know, when you know they can deliver, um, and that makes me just as happy as riding for myself. This is the SoCal Cycling Podcast with Brian Coe. SoCal, SoCal, SoCal Cyclist, and I'm assuming that's a Southern Calcutta. Just kidding. <laughs> Probably Southern California. Of course it is, so join us for the next episode. Welcome to the SoCal Cyclist Podcast, the podcast that brings you the people and practice of the Peloton. I'm your host, Brian Coe, and we are at the Season 2 finale. Man, it has gone by quick, but the Season 2 finale of the podcast. What does that mean? We're taking a little bit of a break, just a very short break, because we've got so many other things going on. We've got our gear guide reviews we're gonna populate. We have photo essays we're gonna do on SoCalCyclist.org. We've got more interesting, fun projects coming up in the works. And so we can focus on that and then also work on season three because we already have some great things planned for that. So do stay tuned. We're just gonna take a short hiatus, but hey, we decided to leave you with a fantastic show today. We're gonna sort of break up the show into several segments. The first segment is we're going to hear from our favorite bike attorney, Josh Benici. Uh, And then after that, we're going to get into our guest, Robin Carpenter of Rally Cycling. He signed on for two years with Rally. He just finished his first season and he's about to start his second. And he has got um, a lot to say about his experience with Rally and also just racing in the United States. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get into Ask a Lawyer with Josh Benici. The first thing I always tell people is call the police. If you don't actively hear someone or someone tells you, hey man, I'm calling 911, call, okay? Um, Someone will, you need someone to come out. Um, Even though you're not gonna look down and see that your knee is broken or a bone sticking out of your arm, call the police, okay? Is that because the police provide a, uh, like a referee between both parties? In a perfect world, I want a police report. If I'm looking at this as, as an attorney, if I'm, if I'm consulting a, a cyclist who this may or may happen to, um, you want to have a police report for a couple of reasons. That's going to ideally document the other person's contact information correctly. Hopefully they gather information from witnesses while you're assessing your injuries, maybe getting into the ambulance, getting your bike off the road, trying to find where your Garmin went when you got hit, all that stuff they're kind of doing do, their due diligence to make sure that everything is recorded. Mm-hmm. Um, they may take pictures. A lot of times the, the police is actually the one who takes your bike, your broken bike, to the hospital with you. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the biggest complaints I hear is that the cops show up and don't make a report. One of the, uh, what, what normally happens is the cop shows up, they talk to each other, they facilitate some sort of exchange and they ask the cyclist, are you hurt, are you okay? Most of the time, we try to kind of toughen up, and we're looking at each other, and we got, you know, uh, our endorphins are going, uh, I, I, you know, I'm okay. Mm-hmm. Because you're looking at yourself, and you're, you're, you're intact, you know, your bibs are all ripped, bleeding a little bit. But and you're, you're kind of in shock, too, totally. at the same time. Yeah. It happens in car accidents, happens in bike accidents. Police officers are supposed to write reports when there's an injured party. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm completely not telling you to say that you're injured when you're not. Mm-hmm. But if you're looking at yourself and you're going, wow, I think I'm going to be pretty darn sore tomorrow, mm-hmm. then saying that, yeah, you know what, I am hurt, is going to more than likely facilitate getting a police report done. And that usually will help you in the long run. 
Is there anything you should say to the driver, or the other person involved in the accident? Um, not particularly. Um, I'd rather you, I'd rather them not be making statements to them. Um, it happens naturally. What the heck? Why didn't you see? Exactly. Me? You pulled right in front of me. Where was the blinker? All that stuff. I mean, yeah. That's naturally going to come out. But you're distracted driving. You know, you're on your phone. Right. I mean, you know, that stuff kind of happens by itself. But there's nothing you need to say, other than. Um, you know, maybe taking a picture of their ID, take a picture of their license plate of the car, take a picture of the damage to the car. Maybe you hit their, um, you know, the, the, the classic one that I've been seeing a lot is someone makes a right hand turn in front of a cyclist. Mm -hmm. And so you dent their door and like break their mirror, take a picture of it. Um, that's all stuff that you should be doing. Um, even if a police is on the way, snap those pictures, um, take a picture of your injuries, of your broken bike. Um, I got a guy who took a picture of the blood that he dripped onto the concrete. Um, really? Yeah. Um, <laughs> bloodied up his hand really good, and he was bleeding, and he took pictures of the blood on the concrete. Um, guy blew out one of his pedals, an Ultegra pedal. Uh -huh. um, it was in a couple of pieces. Uh, take pictures of that. I had a guy coming down Mount Soledad cooking about 32, 33. His Cannondale, I think it was a Super 6, uh -huh. four separate pieces it broke into. How did it, did he, did he hit a car? He, the car pulled in front of him. Mercedes made a left in front of him as he's going down, hit the fender, went over the hood, broke his nose, has some facial issues. His bike literally exploded into four separate pieces. Wow. Um, and they took a picture of it, you know, that, that day, like at the scene, the intersection, all that stuff. Use that smartphone that you got. That's my biggest thing is you don't need to write anything down, take a picture of the insurance, license plate, intersection, ID, and you're golden. But ideally, we're having the police there. They're talking to, to witnesses, and they are um, making a report. Okay. So anything, anything you you should not be doing that in the heat of the moment, people maybe, I don't know, people's emotions are high. Like oh, man. <laughs> people's emotions get super high, and I totally get it because again, your um, you know your adrenaline's rushing, um, you know. Um, calling people bad names never never does any good. Um, you know, um, getting physical with the person who um, hit him. I, I don't see that very much, but you know, you 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 want to personify the cool, calm, collected cyclist who's the victim. Okay. Right. I, I, it, and road rage happens. Bikes, cars, cars, right. cars, motorcycle, everything. Now let's say the driver is losing their cool. Right? Yeah. Um, Again, go get your smartphone if it, hopefully it's not broken, and just video, mm -hmm. just video that sucker, and um, you know, and then they, again you're using that. The police show up and they're continuing to be not a nice person. Let them deal with it. Let them deal with it. Um, you should be focusing on making sure you're intact, calling your loved ones. If you need to get in that ambulance, go. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, I never. I always tell people, don't think about a case. Don't think about. Um, how much is this going to cost? If you need the help, get the help. Yeah. And then everything else can get worked out at the end. I know people that didn't want to take an ambulance because they're like, oh, this is going to cost me, and, you know, and they're injured mm -hmm. on the road and they're thinking, this is going to cost me thousands of dollars. Maybe I'll just sure. go home and, and, and heal up or maybe take a taxi or something. You know, you, I, you need to do what's best for you on whether or not that's the best call for you at the time, then do it. Um, the average ambulance bill I see is about $2,000. Um, if you have health insurance, they're hopefully going to pay something of that, right? Um, but, you know, you need to do what you need to do. Mm -hmm. um, one cool thing about how I've set up my practice is when we get medical bills in like that, we can usually either postpone payment on stuff like that, make, facilitate getting health insurance to pay adequate amounts on those, or, um, you know, Putting them on some sort of delay so that people don't have to, you know, worry about paying out of pocket or, or collections or whatnot. So, because they know that you know if this turns into a case that there's money at the end of the tunnel, right. and so a lot of times they will okay, we'll we'll wait to bill this person until the money comes in, and that's one less stressor that someone has to think about. Again, don't take an ambulance just to create a bill, but if you need to do that, that should that hopefully can, I guess, ease your mind on worrying about the cost. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. And it sounds like, too, like you almost have to calm yourself down in the heat of the moment. I mean, I've I've been in situations where I'm riding with my friend. A door opens. We narrowly miss it. 
and it's like all of a sudden your adrenaline just spikes sure. and you yell at the guy or girl and <laughs> maybe not the nicest things <laughs> and uh but again it's that whole education of drivers who you know what i do i when i'm riding next to cars not only do i give myself ample space i look in the rear view glass to see if there's a human head if there's a face in it if there's a face in it if there is i'll give myself a little bit more room yeah and i check for brake lights and reverse lights all you know and for me um it's scanning it's just constantly scanning and i know in boxing they say you know, if you're if you're fighting an opponent, you want to if someone swings for you, maybe throws a haymaker, you want to miss by just a little bit. You don't want to do these big exaggerated movements. You want to expend as little energy as possible. So if someone's punching your face, you just move enough out of the way to not get hit, not have to not have to completely move out of the way. So if you're on the bike, a lot of times people will see a door open or something and then overcorrect and maybe miss the door, but cause another accident, uh, maybe next to their riding buddy, or they go too much into traffic. So it's almost better, at least for me, to just miss by a little. Maybe that's the crit racer in me. Well, you don't want to make these exaggerated movements. I don't, you know, and hold, hold the line. I mean, how many times does that get yelled in the group, in a you know a group ride or, or, or crit or something? But um, I mean, really, that was a big thing that I had to learn coming from mountain biking into road racing, mm -hmm. right? And my buddies were like, hey, man, these road bikes are fast. Like, you, know, you look over your shoulder real quick, you're going to be drifting to your left a foot or so when yeah. on a mountain bike, there's a lot more play involved, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, you're constantly scanning, you're making these movements, um, and that really, you know, you got to keep your head on the swivel. There's a lot going on with that. Um, but that's part of being a cyclist and running fast and running in the beautiful places that we do that other people like to be at at the same time. Well, when you're in traffic, too, obviously there's, there's you know, parts of traffic where the speed limit's 25. Yeah. And a lot of times you're going faster than 25. You are going the speed of traffic uh, and you're overtaking cars. Can you use the other lanes so say you're all going in the same direction speed limits 25 you're going 26 27 uh can you take the not necessarily the furthest right lane can you take other lanes if you want to pass traffic not i'm not talking like bike messenger weave through a bunch of parked cars but i'm saying like, acting like a vehicle act, yeah because bikes are technically vehicles if you're going the speed limit or going the speed of traffic you are allowed to take the lane it's kind of I mean that's that's the that's the, the most direct way without going into you know weaving or or whatnot but the law says if you're going the speed limit or the same um, speed of traffic mm -hmm. um, now passing a car in a lane while you both uh, are in the lane that can sometimes get a little tricky right yeah. um, um, I've actually handled a couple of cases with motorcycles doing lane splitting um, do not pass a car on the left if you're in a single lane. On the right hand side is a little bit more accepted. Mm -hmm. I had a claim denied from a motorcycle passing cars on the left and got hit. Because they were splitting the lane through part On the left hand side of traffic. Oh, so okay. it, was, it was one way traffic. Right. Motorcycle was on the left hand side of that car uh -huh. passing. Lane, share, lane splitting is legal, but not on the far left of a car. If they're be in between two different cars, that's gonna be where um, they'll be able to pass and you're probably going to be safer as a cyclist as well. Mm -hmm. um, the tough part is, you know, those, these cars aren't looking for you coming from behind them when they're making the right hand turns. Um, in the past several months, that's probably the majority of the cases I'm seeing is um, cyclists in a bike lane or on the right hand side of the road, a car passing them and then making a right into a driveway. Um, mm. Right into them, pretty no much. No signal a lot of times. And Right. And that's the hardest, and that's the hardest part is when, you know, if you pass a car, that I don't want to say you're inviting that, but that's inviting the situation to occur more. Yeah. So it's almost it's better tough. to assume between you and the car in front of you, assume that car is going to turn. If there's a if there's a driveway coming. Yeah. If there's a driveway yeah. or a street and they're, you know, they let off the gas. A lot of times, I just give myself a little bit more room because if they do turn, that's a T-bone waiting to happen. Or I take the lane. Yeah. Look yes. Behind them. For more great advice and to contact Josh Benici himself, go to BeniciLawGroup.com. 
Next up, we hear from one of America's top domestic racers, SoCal's Robin Carpenter, currently in his first half of his contract with Rally Cycling. So the last time you were here was back in 2016. A lot has changed since then. You were on the Holoesco Citadel team. You were um, kind of just, you had just won, I think the year before, a stage at uh, Colorado in the rain on a solo break in the, in, mm-hmm. on a descent and stayed away. And then one thing I noticed, we kind of, you know, you came on the podcast early. The podcast has, has sort of matured with you. And I remember the day that your last episode aired, you were doing a tour of Utah. You were in a breakaway with like a Colombian dude or a Cuban dude. Yep, yep. And you took the stage and you took the leader's jersey at the same time. And I'm like, is this coincidence? I don't know. Maybe it Fortuitous is. Fortuitous timing. Yeah. Yeah. So who knows? When, whenever this episode's released, maybe you should buy a lottery ticket or something. <laughs> You just let me know. <laughs> or go out and smash some, some Strava KOMs. Uh, go for Tory Pines. Yeah, you got to get that back Once from... Uh, who's Who's got it now, Phil? Oh, of course, Phil, yeah. He let the world know about that <laughs> one. Um, what would, what is it, one. like five minutes up Tory Pines? Or uh, I think it's five? down to about four and a half, 420 now. Wow. Yeah, it's quite quite fast. Okay, when you did it, though, did you get motor paced by a scooter? Uh, no, I did not. I had a, a, slight, a slight lead out from, from Adam Mills. Uh, okay. But... It was kind of, it was kind of windy, so it, would, <laughs> it wasn't ideal. But I did. You have to do. You have to wait for the day to be right with the wind. You right. Have to wait for that sort of a elusive north wind to be pumping out. We got to get before you leave San Diego. You got to get Tory Pines back. <laughs> we'll put you in a funny skin suit. Perfect. Lead you out. We'll cut the drops of the bars to you know minimize yeah, the those weight. Needless handlebars. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's you know it's kind of cool to see you. Full circle, not full circle, but just continuing to evolve Thanks, as a as a person and as a cyclist. Um, I think it's no secret that you know you just spent the last season on the rally cycling team, which you know it's not a lateral move from Holowesco. No disrespect to that team because fantastic riders, fantastic organization. But rally is pro Conti, and um, you're able to race um, not just the big ones in the United States like Tour of California, but um, the other races as well. How did sort of the season go for you looking back now that we're kind of in the off season? It was a pretty good season. Uh, for some reason, I tend to get, uh, I don't know, better form the later we go in the year. I don't know if that's just from <laughs> like poor preparation over the winter or who knows. But uh, the first half of the season was, you know, kind of meh. And I got pretty sick around Tour of California. Uh, but then we did this great uh, five-week trip to Northern Europe in August. And the team just totally, totally crushed it. I think everybody exceeded expectations. We did all these, like, I don't know, Scandinavian races. and these. Did you it, do Tour of Norway? And- uh, we did the Arctic race of Arctic. Norway, which is even crazier than the Tour of Norway because it's all above the Arctic Circle. So were you just freezing cold? It, was, it wasn't It was that bad. It was probably the, <laughs> the first ride when we got there, I think, it was like 45 degrees, 48 degrees. So that was like a bit of a shock, especially because the rest of Europe was going through some sort of massive heat wave. So it was almost 100 degrees in Brussels. Wow. So and that, so I mean, we had just raced in Denmark where there's zero air conditioning and it was like 95. Right. So, yeah, it, one of the cool things of being on rally is you can probably do more international races than you were on your old team. Yeah, they really stepped it up this year. They, I mean, that was, I think that was one of the reasons why I switched is because there was this big sort of two to three year plan of doing more races in Europe and sort of expanding their schedule um, and trying to grow the team. And they totally delivered on that for, for everyone this year. And it's not like you've never raced in Europe before either. Like yeah. you've done, you've raced in Belgium and, and other parts, but doing some of the bigger races, I, I remember seeing you on the internet at Tour of Denmark, mm-hmm. you know, finishing right behind Wout van Aert yeah, yeah. Um, at one of the stages. And then just seeing the very distinct orange rally kits more prevalent in the, in the not world tour, but just, just right there. But those races that you, you know, tune in on in the morning and on, you know, your pirated Eurosport <laughs> stream or whatever, and you get to see, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it was, uh, I mean, both eye-opening to see, like, what European World Tour pros are able to do, but also um, it was pretty encouraging. I thought that, you know, 
to see just we have guys like Colin, guys like Brandon, um, who are able to play on that stage and able to like. I mean, Colin won that stage of Norway, um, and I was close, but no cigar a couple of times in those races. But it's nice to be there and like not just get spit out the bag. Um, Does it sort of strengthen your resolve to be like, hey, I should be in Europe? Or do you, are you more like, hey, I want to grow my presence racing both in the United States and Europe? Or are you just like, I'm in Europe, I'm, I'm competing against Europeans, I, I belong here kind of thing? Yeah. Just, uh, <laughs> judging by how the... <laughs> the scene in the u.s is going i think that my brand of uh, of of bike racing is going to be more useful in europe for the time being so for the people that don't know your brand you're, you're not necessarily a sprinter you're not a climber uh i've read on twitter that you can hold 700 watts for a couple of minutes <laughs> oh yeah but i, I forgot course. who tweeted that one of your competitors uh what was his name um it's a CCB rider that we were in a, a local crit in Pennsylvania. He was exaggerating. <laughs> By the way, I cannot do that. You can't hold 700 watts for two <laughs> minutes? No, I think I can do that for about a minute usually. Yeah. Okay, that's still, <laughs> for the for us mere mortals, 700 watts for over anything over a minute. That's just, that's insane. But I mean, so the style of riding sort of lends itself to... Uh, maybe a Belgian classic or a one day or a short stage race. Yeah, some sort of rolling race maybe with not necessarily mountains, but some hills and just sort of allows, uh, you know, I like breakaways and I like being able to sniff out a race that's like a finish that's hard, but not like playing to the specialists. And uh, there's a lot, I don't know, there's just a lot more road racing in Europe and there's a lot, a lot more variety and there's a lot more races that are like sort of geared more specifically to that than just, I don't know. In the U.S., it seems like most of the races, if you need to, if you want to do well, you have to either be a sprinter or you have to either be able to go uphill really, really well. And just, and it's not just that too, but the, the amount of races are starting to go away. Exactly. Yeah. And so I road mean, stage races. Yeah. No, and I'm a, you know, I've grown up just doing road racing and doing stage races and been, you know, bred into a stage racer at this point from, that sort of training and there's just, I don't know, it seems like that scene's kind of on the lull here. And if I, I don't know, you know, not to be too pessimistic, but if, if, you know, need to want to keep doing this for a job, then Europe might be the place to go. Um, mm -hmm. And rally seems to be, you know, on their way up. Who knows what their plans are? You know, it really depends on uh, pulling in sponsorship money and trying to get people like partners to step up with their, uh, with their contributions, but you know, I bet we'll try to get into the Welta in 2019, maybe. And you know, if things keep going well, then you know, who knows if they get the if things go well and they get the sponsorship money, maybe they apply for a world tour license. But it seems like they're they're focusing, you know, big race in the U.S. but bread and butter racing in Europe, and that's I think that's the way to go. Well, I I think too rallies kind of the one benefactor of having the cycling scene sort of shrink because rally is sort of the last like major team at the, at the top. There's no jelly bellies. There's no UHC. So you take maybe some riders that were on there and, and mm -hmm. could head towards your, so, so Jonas can sort of pick from You're getting this concentration. Yeah. Get the concentration yeah. Yeah. And, and really get the best of the best and then use that as leverage to say, Hey, we have some great, American, North American riders, uh, maybe a few Europeans that could go to Europe. Um, so maybe, I don't know, there's a silver lining in the in the shrinking of, of pro cycling. I mean, who knows who's going to be on Floyd Landis's, uh, <laughs> yep. Floyd's of Leadville team coming mm -hmm. up. Um, but I just, as, as this podcast is coming out, it's, it's definitely in the news. Um, so he's actually adding. But yeah, Rally's, um, you know, one of the few teams, like a full men's, full women's squad, it's your first year on the team. Did they sort of give you free reign to, to do certain races or were you more, um, you know, supporting people? Uh, how did, how did your season go with this new outfit? Uh, it went, I mean, I think it went great. I was, you know, you're always, I was, you know, I was spent five years on hollow Esco where you just basically called and spend that whole time cultivating friendships and it was a small program. So everybody's just, you know, they're just buddies. And, you know, moving to a new team, it was like, well, is it going to be, you know, 
it's fun to hang out and like chill with your boys and you know whatnot or is, is the staff going to be cool to hang out with or is because in you know in pro cycling there's a lot of times there's just stiffs everywhere people yeah. are just worried about doing their job and getting paid and going home and uh, you never know so but then i was i was pleasantly surprised by by rally we had a the first time i kind of met everybody was last december at this uh winter camp that they had in colorado where there was no bikes except for fat bikes at this like you know we were up in uh, winter park which is like a big uh you know snow sports resort uh-huh. nine thousand feet in, in december um and we just drank beer and played basketball and cross-country skied and just sort of messed around in december which is like you know kind of time when people think they should be you know getting on the bike a little more um but it was just nice to see everybody like wanting to hang out and and these are people that you know because you've raced totally totally. most of them but you know you don't really get a sense i was i told them all i was like man i really thought you guys are just gonna be like the boy scout crew um (laughs) and then i don't know it just uh it was nice anyway it was just nice to find out that you know it's they're just fun guys to hang out with so that was good and like that always makes you more stoked about riding for other people um and helping other people out and we have a few guys on the team who are just you know just absolute like talents um like brandon mcnulty obviously and maybe a lesser known name that people maybe people don't actually know is colin joyce who used to be on action um and before that was on cal giant you know up in norcal uh but he's like he's the real deal he was at one of these finishes at the tour de yorkshire this year he was i think he was fifth on like this five minute hilltop and was just on van avermatt's wheel like the whole way up you know just pumping out over 500 watts the entire time wow. and like a, you know like a legit finish with like real contenders there and he's just you know there's old colin joyce just <laughs> hanging out at the front coming up after the break we'll hear more from robin carpenter for listeners in and around orange county a good dentist is hard to find just like your bike your smile needs to be serviced regularly oc healthy smiles was voted 2018's top dentist because your oral health and comfort is our highest priority See the OC Healthy Smiles difference at your next dental exam and cleaning. Also, mention this ad for a free in-office whitening at your first scheduled appointment. Check them out at OCHealthySmiles.com. Schedule an appointment right now, and their offer is limited to the first seven scheduled appointments, so call before it's too late. That's 714-907-4842. Is your bicycle in need of repair? Have you had a bad experience at your local bike shop? Velofix might be the alternative. Velofix is a mobile bike shop on wheels, and what they do is they go to your home as well as your work, and they'll work on your bike right in front of you. They also carry an assortment of soft goods, such as tires and tubes, and will get your bike ready for that next event. Velofix is often seen at many bike races, but can also be seen driving around in case you need them. Velofix will have a quick turnaround time, friendly service, and they'll go to great lengths to make sure you're a return customer. They are featured in almost every major city in the United States, and their base is growing. Velofix is a major bike shop on wheels, and what they have inside those vans is just about everything that the bike shops carry. If they can't do it, nobody will. Check them out at velofix.com. And now back to the show with Robin Carpenter. And so I rode for those guys a lot in the early part of the year. Um, in is there a clear like GC person for rally, or is it? I mean, it's just uh, so much talent. I mean, it kind of depends team. on the race, but yeah, I mean, we Britain, Rob Britain, um, when it comes to like altitude climbing races, especially so like Utah, Colorado, he was kind of the guy because um, he's that's like just he's really good at that sort of thing. Just. Mm-hmm made for it um and we you know we kind of had a two-pronged approach coming into california it was rob and it was brandon um and brandon ended up having a better day i think on uh gibraltar um so we kind of switched a little bit uh but you know it's how it goes it's a it's good to have a flexible a flexible strategy like that just in case something happens because you know everything happens in pro bike exactly there's so much that goes on i mean i mean if you look at the biggest teams like Sky and Movie Star, they stack their teams deep. Oh yeah, you yeah. know, yeah. Movie Star had Quintana Valverde and and uh, Landa, mm-hmm. who could all 
win, but it's like, why not just stack them with whoever? Yeah, and you know, if things go wrong with one of those guys, which is bound to happen, then like you've got somebody waiting in the wings, which is, you know, the whole, I mean, that was the whole Sky thing. Like, yeah, we're here for Froome, but, you know, G had literally nothing happen to him the entire <laughs> three weeks. Nothing it, bad yeah. the entire time. Like, it's almost who's the most lucky. Yeah. Not I mean, necessarily some, he's the most strong. Extent, yeah, exactly. Or just, you know, just able to keep themselves in the right position and stay out of trouble, whether that's staying out of the gutters so you don't flat at a weird time or just staying at the front so you're, you know, ahead of the, the stupid, crazy crashes that you know are going to happen. Like, yeah. Uh, without a doubt. Do you think rally is more sort of a, just off the bike, uh, just a, what kind of organization in terms of like your traveling and the logistics and making sure you're at a certain place at a certain time, is that m- more next level than, than what you've been used to? Or is it something that it's, you know, kind of good old boys having a good time, but at the same time, it's a very pro organization. No, it's definitely, it's, there's definitely, I mean, so circuit sport is the company that, uh, Charles Aaron are. So I guess you call him the owner of the team. He owns that company and that, company owns the team um and you know inside of that we have you know a photographer whose sole job is to is to photograph the team and we've got uh tom soliday who used to be a writer whose sole job is doing social now um on all the platforms so and i think we also have a uh, georgia gould um former ex ex uh, badass mountain biker doing uh like logistics in part for us um so yeah, there's just there's a lot more organization. There's people who's you know this is the job to do. It's not just somebody else sort of like doing it on you know like on kayak booking flights or something. Like <laughs> I mean I don't know what Georgie uses, but you know it's she's you know she knows what she's doing, and you know they everybody has like I mean we have someone who's somebody who I've met once who does all of the reimbursements. You know? Okay. So it's a it's a very well run organization. It's yeah it's been it's been around for quite a long time. It has. Formerly known as Optum, formerly known as Kelly Benefit Strategies. Yeah. It's almost yeah. like the new Jelly Belly, if I could dare to say that, even though yeah, it hasn't been around yeah, as long. I think I think we've been around like 12 years or so. Okay, so close. Yeah. Closer. Um, at least, and as long as I've been paying attention to any sort of pro bike racing in the U.S. So, yeah. Yeah, it's a, I, I feel... Ex- yeah, it's ridiculous how lucky I feel this are, year. Are you... <laughs> do, you don't have to answer this next question, but are you allowed to say... Who you're riding for next year? Oh, I'm signed up for two years. That's oh, what so, I was about to say is like okay. this year having a two year contract for I you know signed one for getting on the team. I signed a two year contract. Okay, um, and having a contract already in hand at this this off season was just a yeah can't really get more lucky than that just because right everything now, is so bad yes yeah, so, uh, so, so bad. many riders even really good riders are probably sweating a little bit like what am i gonna do oh, sweating a lot i don't yeah. have a team they're losing sleep over it or just a, a new pro going okay my choices went from seven teams to four yeah and they're like and no one's gonna pay you exactly <laughs> they don't have to because <laughs> so, if you just want to keep raising bikes you're gonna sign a contract for no money yeah I, I've always wondered that with with riders, like, is it better to ride for no money on a on your dream team or get paid cycling money, but still getting paid, but being on a lesser team? That's always a tough. Yeah, tough honestly, call. I don't think people are really getting even a choice like that at this point. It's like you either are getting on a team and they're giving what you're going to give you, or you're not going to be on a team at all. You'll be riding for your regional yeah. regional club team. Uh, it's yeah it's uh, i mean it's looking like maybe hololesco will still be around next year just not pro continental and then you have uh floyd stepping in and saving silver which i personally think is hilarious um <laughs> he's using the lance money for it yeah yeah i mean good on him that's uh i mean you know it's kind of dirty money to some extent so to put it towards a bunch of young guys and all, all the guys on that team are you know young sort of up-and-coming canadians that you know i think deserve to be in the races uh so I've got, got no beef with that. Um, so maybe it's not going to be as terrible as maybe it was looking just a little while ago with like Jelly Belly, UHC, yeah. Alolesco, Silver all going away. Um, but still you got guys who are going to be re- like struggling to look for a, a job that pays and they need to, and they need to make money if they're, you know, if you're 28, you can't, you're not still living in your parents' basement. And right. if you've been making money, uh, uh, yeah, you just, you can't go, it's hard to go from, you know, 
sixty thousand, eighty thousand dollars a year to nothing. Um, and it's going to be tough because not only is it there are not many teams that are going to pay you that kind of money here, but in Europe you have a couple of other teams going away, merging, yeah. or I mean, you have like Aqua Blue and uh, B- I like to say BMCCCCCCCC. How how are yeah. Uh But yeah, so there's just a, there's a, I mean there's always seems to eh, every year everybody talks about it being a bad year, but. This year seems especially uh, grim for, yeah. for some folks. I mean, if you, and some of the writers, too, they almost have to plan ahead. Like, I think of guys like, you know, John Hornbeck, who was thinking ahead of, like, I've got to do something in case yeah. it doesn't work out for whatever reason. And so he was already writing articles and, and, and doing things outside of the regular training and stuff. Um, before it's too late. So that way, if it ever came to that. You have a and soft landing. Yeah. You have a bit of a soft landing. And and he's had good success with his whole gravel spandex, yep. Yep. you know, stampede in SoCal. And uh, he's, ironically, he's just recovering from a broken yeah, saw that. <laughs> scapula, I think. Poor, yeah, poor beak. Uh, <laughs> but he's, yeah, I, yeah, I admire Hornbeck for. And you were teammates, right? Yeah, for a year, two years. Yeah. Um, yeah, old. Uh, I, I, mean, I think it's great. I, I mean, I'm thinking, I'm always sort of the last like year of kind of, that kind of thought keeps bouncing around my head. Like what do I need to start thinking about? Like what's going to happen? You know, just in case, you know, something happens like take, and, take Travis McCabe, for example, yeah, uh, who won, you know, three major races, like basically in a row at the end of the season here. And as far as I know, he doesn't have a job yet. Um, and he's and he's, he's one of the good ones. Yeah, he's deserving of a job <laughs> more than deserving. Um, and I, you see that, and you're like, well, that could be me easily, like mm-hmm. <laughs> just different circumstances. So you know, something that watching Hornbeck be able to put together something like that, like totally from scratch, is pretty sweet. And yeah, it makes me makes me wonder what the. What I, th- would I next, think it's but... just like the the a little bit of insurance. Uh, a buddy of mine, uh, Alex Candelario, he mm-hmm. started this bike touring thing in oh, yeah. Hawaii. He actually used to ride for uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Rally, but then it was called Optum. Yep, yep. But same, yeah. same the race deal. against Kando. Yeah. And, you know, he was, I think at his peak, one of the best sprinter, U.S. sprinters around. Um, and, and again, it's so uncertain that, that unless you're getting signed Sagan status and money, mm-hmm. everybody else is super uncertain. Yeah. Um, which doesn't make yourself necessarily a better rider. Maybe it makes you more hungry, but... I don't know. I, I look at I look at the world tour and you look at guys like Bernal who gets a five year contract mm-hmm. with Sky. Like, where does that he's twenty one <laughs> years old. He's gonna be twenty six by the time his contract is up. By then he might have a grand tour under his belt, so to speak, yeah. if he podiums or wins. Mm-hmm. Um and those riders maybe you find once in a generation, but for all the other riders, it's such a mad scramble. Yep. Especially in the United States. I mean, I love the United States. I've, <laughs> I've, in terms of the racing, I always root for for the U.S. racers, but it's just so uncertain yeah. that it's a tough thing. And even, you know, I mean, I was watching just recently the World Championships mm-hmm. uh, in Innsbruck, and I was really looking, hoping for those U.S. racers, and I don't think anyone cracked the top 50. No, no, I think Brent was the highest at like 14 minutes back or something. Yeah. yeah. I mean, granted, that course was that insane. Yeah. Did you watch the. the uh, I actually race? did not watch the Elite Race. I watched the U23 men's race for some reason. Me too. But yeah. <laughs> it was pretty good, though. Yeah. It was. <laughs> I almost thought it was like, I don't know. the Those races that have a little less control and a little more. Uh, they just end up just with, without like a ma- massive favorite or a really strong team. They just end up being a lot more dynamic and there's yeah. all, some, something random is bound to happen, which makes it fun to watch. Did you think you were going to have a shot at the team for Worlds? Oh, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I thought about putting in like, so the way it works for like a selection is there's automatic qualifications, which almost nobody ever makes because they're just obscene. Like it's like. Until this year, Ben King wins two stages at a Grand Tour, which is one of the one of the automatic qualifications. But the rest of them are like top three at Worlds, uh, winning in top five at a Grand Tour. You know, it's right. just stuff that almost never happens. The only one that ever really gets filled is winning nationals. Um, so besides that, it's all discretionary uh, nominations. Comes down to a committee. And so it's all USA Cycling suits that decide. 
Yes, who exactly. gets to make the team. And so anybody can put in a petition, basically, that just, you know, says, hey, I want to do it. Here are my results. Here's why I think I should do it. And I thought about it for a little while because I was on a good run of form in August. Uh, yeah, this is when you're coming into your prime. Yeah, and our team owner, Charles, was at uh, Deutschland and was like, yeah, you should totally do it. You should totally do it. And I was like, okay, my God. and then I... You know, I knew it was going to be a hard course, but then I took a look at a little closer look at the profile. And I was like, <laughs> oh, no. Uh-uh. Nope. No, thank you. I'm out. <laughs> nope. Eight by 20 minutes with the best climbers in the world. I, you know, I, I, <laughs> my, only, <laughs> my only contribution will be maybe making it halfway through with like a few bottles for the guys who can actually climb, like Sepp or Brent or whoever. And then I, it, there's, there's not even a chance I'll finish that race. So Yeah, it was, I think the winning time, Valverde came in at almost seven and a half hours yeah. or seven hours. Yeah. 14 <laughs> or 15,000 feet. Yeah. The last part was an un... Nobody had done the climb. It was like a 3K, 25% climb, in topping sections. out. Yeah, yeah. That looked terrible. And guys were just yeah. zigzagging. Tom, du- Tom Dumoulin paper boying <laughs> up a climb. You have to see... Yeah. You never see that. When are you going to see a Grand Tour winner paper boying The up devil just basically walking next to you. Oh, yeah. Just <laughs> go. You can do it. Right faster. <laughs> no, that looked, that looked terrible. No, I wasn't wasn't interested in that. And actually, now that they, they've released the courses for Yorkshire next year, and those actually look like they'd be much more suited to yeah. somebody like me. So that'd be cool. Were you bummed that Valverde won, or were you stoked? Uh, I mean, he was actually my pick. <laughs> he was my pick. Too. He was my. I was like, "There's no one. No one's going to beat this guy on this race. He's way too good. He's like the climber sprinter of of the moment." Um, so I don't know. It kind of like I was <laughs> watching it. It was like, "Oh my god, Mike Woods about to win the world championship." I, I thought he was sitting right in his slipstream. And he I mean, he, popped, he came he came, he came out. He like stepped out, ready to go. And I think someone said he was like fully cramping or something in the finish. Uh, hmm. So that would have been obviously super awesome. Um, but, you know, what can you do? I don't know. I, I personally like the fact that Valverde can win solely because he's old and I'm old. <laughs> and he, Identify with the old people. Yeah, he, he wins it for the old, old people, which is sort of the, uh, I'd say the U.S. market for cycling. It's basically <laughs> master's guys on fancy. That, especially here in SoCal. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the the I think the general rule is the lesser ability the group ride, the nicer the bike. So if you can chart it out, yeah. like the group ride All the frames down. have S-works written on them. Yeah, or yeah. Pinarello or something, <laughs> campy. And then the nicer, the faster the group ride, it's like your scrappy, you know, just like aluminum or I like that. I no like name that carbon bike. I'll yeah. have to make a chart and put it out there. Turn uh, it into a meme. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. A SoCal frame. meme. Yep. Speaking of SoCal, I mean, you've, you've lived here how many years now? Three years? Uh, four. Yeah. Four. Yeah, four years. Is it sort of the cycling anyway, sort of growing on you or is it, are you ready for a change? No, I, I, I love riding here. Yeah. I, I just, uh, just yesterday, I just did this epic ride with a, a couple friends, uh, who live downtown, but we rode all the way out to Campo, um, and up to Mount Laguna and back. And, and I don't know. I just love, I love being able to get out into the desert here. It's really, really sweet. Like there's absolutely nothing. Yeah. Um, it's funny. Cause in, in SoCal, for the people that visit, I would say most people visit and then go up and down the coast. Beautiful views. Which I do a lot, by the way. I'm, yeah. You will see me on the coast all the time if you live around here. Well, for some people, you have to because that's your way to get home. Totally. Yeah, I mean, that's <laughs> I mean, it's kind of where I live. And like, I don't know. All the coffee shops are on the coast. So if I'm that ever doing true. a ride like that, you know, that's where I'm headed. That's true. But once you venture out east, the scenery, the 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 roads, the elevation it all changes and it's like a whole other world that not as many cyclists actually venture out to Mm -hmm. there's palomar mountain um and just in your neck of the woods you know soledad which is not i mean it's short but kind of pitchy at the end um or great western loop out in east county right out by uh, rancho san diego do you think that your riding has improved because you lived here and were able to train here a little bit Oh, for sure yeah just a consistency that's i think that's like at the most basic, like getting better at any sport is sheerly is, is about consistency, you know, regardless of what else you're doing. And I used to live in Philly, which no, I, mean, I love the East Coast and I get nostalgic every time I go back there. Um, but, you know, it gets the weather. There's always there's always 
crappy weather. Um, yeah. I mean, you you maybe need to wear arm warmers and knees. And maybe a vest. And maybe a vest that you can... If you, you can... start really early and you're going through the lagoons here, you might need a vest in yeah. the wintertime. But besides that, you can ride all year and it, there's nothing stopping you. Um, so that's definitely, yeah, exactly. Maybe better. And like also, just having mountains, that's a, that's a big plus. Why do you think you're one of the few pros that live here? I mean, top pros. There's a bunch of cat ones and sure. things like sure. that. Sure. Uh, I don't know. Those Is things, it cost? Is those it guys tend to cluster for some yeah. for for some things i mean uh you know there's tons of people who live in colorado right and but like the I, bay area i don't get why boulder um, so like this mecca where it snows you no know, dude in yeah the no i'm i'm in total agreement but yeah. like it's very much <laughs> they have they gotta leave at some point all those guys go somewhere else to train yeah. you know like a lot of them go to tucson some of them come out to socal um i think it's just because boulder is very much a scene yeah yeah. And if it's like, oh, this writer on this world tour lives here. Dude. Yeah. And let me tell you, it's not any less expensive than San Diego. I know. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, L.A. too. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I mean, in terms of the weather. Um, yeah. I think in some ways, like, people are a little bit afraid of the big cities because there's just a lot. There's a lot of traffic and you got to know you got to know how to negotiate that sort of thing. Um, and that was one of the things I I'm kind of used to it because I grew up in Philadelphia. So I'm used to that, like you have to ride through a bunch of like urban suburban uh, areas to get out and you have your like little rat paths that you know you know have the fewest stop signs fewest stop lights mm. uh, have the right right ways to go um, in some ways it's kind of like that here like when i first moved here i was i remember not really didn't really have any of the the ways that you go i didn't know about swamis didn't know about like the ways that all the cyclists take and so i would just do these rides in north county and be like man i had to stop like a thousand times because you just don't know you and, and all of a sudden you're in a neighborhood and you had to hit you know five red lights that each take two minutes uh yeah but if you know if you know where you're going yeah then it's good and, and in in north county san diego you can gauge it by how many coffee shops it's like eh, it's about four coffee shops away <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's yeah. about five co- coffee shops away exactly then, you know the busy ones and the not so busy ones it's uh so so it's it's good that you are using socal as a means to progress your cycling just because you know, for for as much as I love SoCal, it does get a bad rap sometimes mm-hmm. with crashes on group rides and, oh, and, yeah. and that aggressive. whole thing. Aggressive drivers, yeah. aggressive cyclists, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and just people on those elliptigos with <laughs> <laughs> you see every manner. There's oh, this yeah. one guy and maybe he needs to come on the potty. He's on this unicycle with aero bars. What? That's and like amazing. he's got knobby tires and he spins at like 120 RPM. You definitely need him on this podcast. Big fat sure. helmet mirror. That's awesome. Uh, you know, just tucking in on a unicycle. Who knows? But yeah, it's definitely an interesting scene here for sure. Are you uh, are you planning on moving anytime soon to a different place? Uh, well, it'll kind of happen on its own to some extent. So my, my wife, Hannah, is uh, the reason why we end, ended up here in the first place is because she is doing phd at ucsd in biology um and so she's four years deep into that now and just submitted uh just resubmitted after review her first uh peer-reviewed paper in uh, the journal um, nature so that was like big first step towards like finishing that whole degree uh so she might be done with that in like definitely under two years i think um and then depending on what she wants to do, but I think she wants to like continue on in academia and that involves like postdoc research um, at another institution almost always, almost no one ever really like does their sort of next research project at the same institution. And UCSD is probably, is definitely like the best, um, has the best biology in this whole area. So I can almost guarantee that it will be, we're gonna end up going somewhere else. And that could be like LA. Do you um, have any input on that? uh my input mostly goes can it not be arctic um (laughs) other than that like you know it's most i'd I'd rather just have her be able to go the best place she can yeah she can go that's going to be like work that she wants to do um it was a little more flexible coming to san diego because we were both an undergraduate and her she was trying to choose places to uh, grad schools to apply to that you know kind of fit the the mold of like a pro cyclist um a lot of stuff in California, yeah, primarily, um, and some some stuff in like uh, like North Carolina, uh, like Raleigh Durham area, and ended up being here, which was turned out great. 
Uh, but yeah, it could be, you know, another two years end up flying off somewhere else. Who knows? Yeah, I, 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 all I can say is that she won't be working at UCSD, and that's about it. Oh, no. <laughs> you got to go to her professors be like, fail, fail this next thing. Keep Have her repeat the class. And <laughs> no, she's a, she's a superstar, so she's she's moving moving through that pretty quickly. Is If if it ever came to, like, hey, you got an opportunity to be full-time in Europe? I mean, that's another, you... that's another, it's, a, it's kind of a, a pipe dream of mine of, like, her being able to finish up here and then being able to find postdoc position somewhere in Europe. Um, and it's tougher because like they don't have, I mean, there's still a bunch of good science going on in Europe, but it's not as concentrated as it is in the United States. There's so much money um, for like health sciences, human health sciences in the U S um, and there's giant universities, giant research universities everywhere. But, you know, maybe she could find a position somewhere over there and, you know, I would have a contract then. Yeah. It's a, I mean, it's a possibility. I don't know if it's particularly likely, but it would be cool. Well, it's so good, and it's kind of refreshing, Robin, that you're actually thinking about your wife in this equation yeah. because so many cyclists are like, no, 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 it's my thing, and the wife just has to go where they go no matter what. And they're almost in a secondary support role yeah. just saying, okay, I got to follow you with your dream. Um and it's kind of good that you're actually thinking and wanting to have both of those things, even though it's incredibly hard, uh, because you know it's you're you're married now. At the time yeah. we last interviewed, yeah, yeah, yeah. you you were maybe engaged or uh, not even engaged yet. No, I don't think. Oh wow! Yeah. So congratulations, yeah, thanks. belated. Yeah, that was great. Uh, no, it's uh, I mean, and it's nice because we both try to like be flexible, and you know, she could have gone, you know, to any grad school that she wanted to. You know, maybe she wanted to go to you know. Madison or you know somewhere in Seattle somewhere not ideal for me but she's like no I'm gonna try to like figure out like which you know where where makes sense for you too and we're kind of still on that same level for the next step um but man she's gonna be making the money later <laughs> <laughs> let me just say that <laughs> if she's if she ends up being a like a if she ends up having her own lab at like an r1 research institution then yeah she's she's gonna be the the breadwinner for sure right um and you know cycling cycling isn't forever um, yeah, but I think it's nice to have like a partnership with trying to do things together and try to try to be flexible. If and when you you decide to stop racing, what do you see yourself doing outside of the? I mean, do you see yourself like becoming a DS or staying involved in cycling some I way? Or? I mean, I wouldn't want to say anything to preclude anything, but it is kind of a brutal livelihood when it comes to travel, um, yeah. especially if you like being home uh, and. <laughs> working for a team after doing this is basically you get to do all the same travel except with like none of the exercise <laughs> <laughs> i've always heard this just being a ds is kind of brutal because you just sit in the car all day just steaming with like adrenaline and like you're just so pumped up and then you got nothing nowhere to put it at the end of the day <laughs> um but i don't know i've also been told a lot in the last two years to start a bakery or a coffee shop or something like that, which also I've heard is also quite brutal. But yeah. Could be, I don't know. It could be kind of an interesting. And, and people venture. are saying that not just because it's a random thing, like you legitimately bake bread and you have this thing. Like, it's become a bit of a fixation. Yeah. yeah a little bit. Of well, how did, how did that lie. even start? I just, I read a book when I read one book and I, and it piqued my curiosity. Uh, it was, it's called, it's called cooked. And it's, um, there's actually, I think like a Netflix series on it now. Oh, really? Um, but I can't remember what exactly it's called. And I'm really struggling to remember the author, uh, which might come to me in a minute. But anyway, he was, the book is basically just about all these sort of universal human, um, like cooking techniques, you know, yeah. whether that's, uh, like eating meat that's been roasted over like an open fire, uh, fermented foods, which, you know every culture has its own version of like a fermented alcoholic drink or some sort of like uh you know fermented uh bread all right so that and that's that's what actually got me interested so i didn't really know anything about sourdough until i read this book and i was like man this is actually pretty cool like this is how you leaven bread it's you don't know, just leaven you don't get fluffy you know soft bread just by tossing in the the packet of yeast it's like <laughs> people had to do this before you could like buy that in the supermarket right. um and it's, you know, it's a universal human thing to uh, have this, like, natural leavening power. And it comes just from 
mixing flour and water and letting it sit out in the open air. Um, and anybody can do it. Yeah. And I just found that fascinating. So I tried it out a few times and like worked all right, you know, and then kind of put it away and then came back to it at one point, a little more serious, a little more time, one off season. And then I just got totally hooked. There's all sorts of, uh, there's all sorts of like bread videos on Instagram now. People like shaping dough, which oh I really? Think, yeah, it, I've even seen like BuzzFeed articles about it now. Like, no here, way. Here's this video compilation of uh, people like scoring loaves of bread because um, I think some people find it like really it's like satisfying soothing, to like watch. a Bob yeah, Ross painting. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. We'll put a little score right here. <laughs> exactly. Uh, or just like the just the, the the texture of the dough. People like to watch that being manipulated. Um, and so yeah, like half my half my Instagram feed is people like cutting open loaves of bread and to show the show the crumb on the inside. Very symmetrical. Yep. Yep. So and, what's your specialty that you that you make? Oh uh, well, I'm still pretty bad at it uh, <laughs> compared to all those people. So I just try to go with something pretty basic, like you know, try to have some whole grains in there because you know keep it you know a little bit healthier, not just straight white bread, um, but like you know. 25 30 percent like whole wheat um and i'm still i'm always basically striving for like this sort of bubbly holy um like loaf that isn't too huh. dense and has you mean like like, like a non-style hole. bread kind of thing where it puffs up no no just like a look it looks like your like standard loaf of bread but when you cut it open it's just not like a it's not a uniform texture it's basically got this sort of like oh. irregular hole structure um, okay and it, it basically that's associated just with like uh really strong fermentation um which contributes not only to like the air bubbles but also to the flavor because uh, when you have the yeast and the bacteria like chewing up all the flowers um uh-huh. they make all this extra flavor that you don't get with really yeasted bread and so, so are no two bites kind of alike depending on what part of the loaf you're eating no it'll be it'll, it'll be uniform but you just get these like uh kind of like umami flavors um in bread which you definitely like wouldn't see yeah, in like a normal loaf you wouldn't think of it right but like when i like an like a loaf that comes right out of the oven um and it's fresh like the crust when it's like nice and browned and super crunchy it has this you know like deep sort of like roasted meaty flavor to it that is like unbeatable i've never yeah heard bread and umami in the same right? sentence yeah it's so good. <laughs> what, what? So, what do you recommend? Like, you eat it with? Do you just eat it by itself, or do you have? Yeah, sometimes other things? just eat it by itself for sure. But yeah, just that and like some high quality. Uh, I've been buying, you know, Kerrygold, which some people might say is you know middling, <laughs> but for me, it's pretty good. Uh, it's either that or the Costco brand. But yeah. you know, just some nice butter, and you know, you know, you know dress it up occasionally. Do the millennial avocado toast or yeah. Know, all the butter, that sort of stuff. But. You know, in a world of, uh, especially because you're a pro cyclist, in a world of like the gluten free people, like <laughs> this is kind of refreshing to see. Oh like. man, gluten free. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Sometimes, sometimes I think that's I should do something like that. Who knows? I don't know how much truth there is to any of it. But yeah. you know, for me, I think I've, you know, I don't know. I can't, <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna keep eating bread. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you have to. Do you ever make yeah. uh, like? pizza dough or anything that's yeah, my thing occasionally yeah. i've been grilling pizza dough on the grill grilling directly pizza see that's challenging work it's yeah. it's hard because i have to monitor it on the grill because oh, yeah the top and the bottom top and bottom <laughs> turn it 90 degrees get the char yeah i've done that a couple of times it's, actually it's, it's work it is work but it comes out pretty good especially when it's if good you, it's if good. you don't have like you know a, a dedicated pizza oven if you're trying to get that temperature you know that you can't yeah. get in a standard oven Man. That, that browning that all right here's the plan you'll do rally for the next year in the meantime you got to keep making bread keep improving the bread and then keep keep doing that get a small loan op- open up a little storefront you'll get some kick-ass coffee yeah there bread go. and then boom you'll just you can start opening them up yeah just on just in solana beach right on the right on the coast there oh, yeah, yeah where people sweet. will pay like 15 dollars for, a, for loaf. a loaf of bread oh they will too yeah <laughs> Good old, good old one percenters. It's great, man. Who, who would have thought we would, we would? Go? I had all these other questions. <laughs> oh, bike racing questions. No one wants to hear about that. No one wants to hear about that. <laughs> I'm person. Yeah, everybody else builds their brand around bike racing. I'm just building my brand around yeah brand pastries. You can you can do like a logo or something imprinted. So when it when it expands or cuts, it's like reveals nice. itself. That's I like that. That yeah. almost like a branding thing. Um, man, you could do so much with that. But I, you know, I think. 
cyclists love food and they love totally. to eat and they know what's good and they know what isn't. Yeah. And especially, you know, with, you know, a lot of the guys are fed. You've probably been in some good hotels and some mm-hmm. not so good mm-hmm. hotels. Do you have a chef that travels with you or? Uh, no, we do not. Um, a lot so, of the races we do provide the, they like provide the meals. Uh-huh. Um, at the hotels and whatnot. It's not really until you get to like the real big important races where the teams will have like a traveling chef. Like the Grand Tours, I think almost all teams have their own yeah. their own chef traveling around with them because it's just it's too specific. The, your your food your nutrition requirements just get too crazy for it to be handled by or to basically to leave it to chance for like a hotel to provide the meals because a lot of times yeah. those are they can be they can be real grim. Like the options at a hotel meal and sort of a middling level race in France or Spain, it is grim. Yeah. You don't want any uh, tainted meat no, to come back and haunt you. Not. Yeah. <laughs> the However. way it did with Contador. <laughs> no tainted meat for me, please. Man. So in terms of this year, is it, is there anything that you're looking, I mean, you have, a, I didn't know that you had signed on for two years. So next year is going to be your last year. Are you going to sort of, uh, do you have any sort of, uh, Grand Tour aspirations or one day, you know, targeted races like it would be really cool if I could do that or races in the U.S. Like, do you have any kind of things that you're looking forward to uh, next season? Yeah, I mean, I would I think it would be definitely on the, the list of things to do is to, to race a Grand Tour. That would be you know, a big one, especially because I feel like I'm pretty good at stage racing. Um, what's the longest one you've done so far uh actually it was back in 2012 i did the 10 day tour de guadeloupe down in the caribbean no way yeah that's a crazy race that is a that is a nut house race. Whoa. Uh, i can't i didn't even know that race existed yeah is it, yeah well there's races everywhere man you it's just, a uci yeah. it's a uci race it's actually technically a europe tour because it's a uh, guadeloupe's a french colony oh really um yeah i did that with uh the baby garmin team chipotle development back okay. in the day uh yeah, it was just insane. And it's a tiny island, so you race on all these same roads over and over again uh, for <laughs> 10 days. Uh, but I don't know. Yeah, besides that, I, I don't know. There's a, I've always been pretty content just to like, you know, be able to make a living doing this and, you know, get paid to race a bike and wherever that may be. But now having been, in, been to Europe a little more and been to some of the higher level races that uh, happen, I think it's, you know, I try not to overshoot with my goals and try not to be too too far out there but i'd love to race like the biggest classics um like i don't think that i would just get be, be getting spit out i think i could you know at least you know be in the break or well whatever. especially uh, rally too they're not in it for participation totally you know they're yeah. they're in it i was watching what was the race in china uh there's one going on right now and i Taihu Lake yeah Taihu, right i saw i was watching and rally's in there um no 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 no. i'm sorry scratch that rally's not in there i'm thinking of your competitors Uh, yeah uh which we don't have to name but um it's sort of it's sort of being in that uh kind of atmosphere and space that uh lets you kind of open up your legs i mean you have raced against the best in the world you've raced against like bernal and yeah totally um, the best climbers the best sprinters and and you're in the mix um do you feel like you're, you know, you you have next year a little bit more free reign to do what you want to do? Ah, uh, maybe. I guess. I mean, I I have no qualms about riding for like my teammates who are, you know, when they when they know, when you know they can deliver, um, and that makes me just as happy as riding for myself. And in some ways, it's easier because your job's done well before the action starts, or you know, you don't have to, you know, be the one like really towing the line at the end of a race uh but you also have to be careful not to like fall too far into that role of just riding support because it's you know it's an ugly sport sometimes and if you're not getting results you're not getting on a team and you're not getting paid so uh but you know i think uh rally is going to be all is, is always going to be sort of a lesser team at these races that we're trying to do and the lesser teams what do they do they go into breakaways. Yeah. Um, they and that's, they, they and make that's what the I'm race happen. At. Yeah. So I think I, I envision that being sort of a staple. Uh, and it was a staple of this year of, for what I was doing. It started in Dubai when uh, Brendan and I almost uh, pirated that hot a damn stage from the rest of the world tour teams yeah. that were there who did not see it coming one bit. That was pretty sweet. And then I was just 
riding the brake at a lot of these these other races. Is that the one where he almost took the stage? Yeah, he got caught at like you know thirty meters to go or something something heartbreaking. But yeah, I mean that's a that's kind of where I envision myself going to the brakes or um, looking for you know late breakaways too. Not just like the suicide break that yeah happens at every bike race, but actually trying to be smart about it and take advantage of when it when it wants to be taken advantage of. That was. One of the big things this year that we were kind of stressed at, especially by our DS, uh, uh, Eric Wahlberg, who's like, you know what? There's no chance of a break making it today. We don't need to just be there to, to fly the colors. We want to do something in the race. So it might be a breakaway, but it's going to be later, or it's going to be on a stage where the breakaway has a, at least a prayer of making it. So, yeah, we're looking to get into big, great, bigger races next year. It'll be a similar calendar, um, but, you know, as a pro county team, it really you really rely on invites to mm-hmm. a lot of these races, and so it can kind of go one way or another. But I think we showed uh, a lot of the big players this year uh, that we like racing, and we're not just there to hang out and follow the script, which I think I think races like, um, and I think they like to see more of. So, and then sort of last question, but you know, we're we're I feel that American cycling is kind of in a transition. What what sort of advice would you give to a young up and comer who's sort of on the bubble, and has to make that choice? Like, what what sort of advice would you give to that person, looking to reach out, looking to make a name for themselves, looking to not just ride for their regional team, but mm-hmm. enough to make a decent, not even a decent living, but a living at it? Yeah. What would you What would you say to that? I mean, I've always said that. If you have some talent, the key is just not to quit when everybody else is quitting. So I never was one of those phenom juniors. I've been do I've been doing road racing since I was fifteen, and I didn't race for the national team until I was twenty two, um, which is like generally regarded as like oh you're making it you're gonna you're gonna make it you're gonna be a pro if you're with the U S national team when you're eighteen and you know nineteen twenty whatever. Um, and I was like, I thought I was good, you know, you know, decent enough. Uh, and I just watched all these guys, all these peers who definitely had been in the sport longer than me, had been doing a lot more races than I had been doing in Europe. And they just, you know, they just slowly drop one by one by one. And then suddenly, I don't know, like, I would never have expected to be on top of like the UCI America Tour rankings like last year, I think that was, or two years ago. Mm-hmm just that was you. so is it didn't, never, just... didn't make any sense so i think like yeah like best best advice i give is just mm-hmm. to plug away and know that you love it and not to quit but side note it's good to go to school yeah because um, you don't want to be going to school as you know a 28 year old 27 year old it's it's not as much fun you know you're and and if you keep Unless you're really like on the level of someone like a McNulty or someone I don't know like that junior guy Evan Pohl who just took out the double at, at Junior Worlds, if you're skipping out on on living life um, when you're that age, it's gonna eat at you. It's gonna it's you gonna never have it back. And when it's just gonna you're just gonna be thinking the entire time like I mean what if like what am I missing out on? What am I missing in terms of like having fun and making friends and uh building a life for myself and it's i think that's probably one of the reasons that i see saw most of these guys who were my age stop racing or quit the sport is because they got maybe they got injured or they did like they got a taste of like going to school and like just being a 20 year old you know just Mm -hmm. like being an idiot and you know sometimes cycling pales in comparison to that life it's so interesting you mentioned that because there, on the flip side of that, there's so many rec riders that are like, I would do anything to be a pro and totally. like imagine themselves. The romance of this sport is exactly. un- undeniable for sure, which is what keeps it alive to some extent. Oh, and they pay full retail, Yeah, exactly. which is important. <laughs> is it, yeah, please keep doing that. <laughs> Tell your friends. Man. Well, Robin, thanks so much for coming in. You provide such amazing insight. It's so cool to see you too. Like from the first time you went on till till now, I mean, you've just had this sort of steady rise and you're doing it your own way and on your own terms. Thanks, dude. And who knows? I got to try some of this bread. <laughs> hey, man, I can make a delivery. We just got to arrange it. I need two days warning and we can make it happen. Oh, man. Sounds fantastic. Thanks so much. Thank you, man. 
And that is our show, and that is our season, season two finale with Robin Carpenter. Hey, I just wanted to say thank you so much, not only to all of our sponsors, but of course all the people who made this season such an interesting part. We are we are already working on season three, so don't think this is like the finale forever, but we're working on season three, plus all of the side projects. Uh, a lot of stuff and news and information you can find out on uh, SoCalCyclist.org as well as the Facebook page, SoCal Cyclist Podcast, and Instagram at SoCal underscore Cyclist. But we have a lot of things going on. Um, we're re- going to be reordering more clothing for our online store. We're kind of running out of things, and um, we're going to be repopulating the store. We've got some cool, fun local things as well as things that everybody can check out and read and be a part of uh, during sort of the off season of cycling so please do stay tuned and if you want to get a hold of me i am brian at socalcyclist.org but until next time this is brian co for josh benici and robin carpenter saying respect the wave respect the wave